That two years of my life was the hardest I had ever experienced. You don't know where your next meal is going to be and never want to be in that spot again because it's just my biggest fear is not getting there in time for my parents. That's the reason I get up. From humble beginnings to unparalleled success, Ilya's journey started when he emigrated from Belarus at just three years old. Ilya dropped out of college to support his dad and work at his plumbing company when suddenly David Dobrik, his high school buddy in a YouTube phenom moved Ilya into an LA mansion to join the vlog squad. Ilya's unwavering loyalty has helped him launch successful businesses where he works with them together, like Zila Fitness and Dobrik's Pizza. So stay tuned for Ilya's accomplishments, his story, his journey, how he got to who he is today. My name's Eric. I'm co-founder of Carrot. We help creators like Ilya with their finances. And join us today for 36 questions to fall in love with Ilya. I'm here today with a special guest, Ilya. You might know him as one of the original creators behind the Vlog Squad, but you might also have noticed in the past couple of years, he started multiple businesses. Zila Fitness, helping him, his clients, and his friends get in incredible shape. Dobricks, helping you then make up for all the exercise you did by eating delicious pizza. And before that, based on my own research, I think he also ran a plumbing company too. Yep, my dad and myself for uh, seven years. Yeah. So from the very start, well, even before you were doing content, you were in the plumbing business. Yes, I was. It was uh, definitely very different from what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, but at, at that time, uh, it's, a, it's a really long story. If well, we've got some time. Tell it. me more. How did plumbing start and <laughs> yeah. how did that turn into YouTube? Uh, so to, to sum it up, to like shorten it a little bit, but to give you the, the general synopsis, out of college, I went to, excuse me, out of high school, I went to community college for a semester. At that point, I realized that school was not for me. The people that I was surrounded by um, did not have the same dreams that I did, right? And uh, you're a product of your own environment. So I said, I'm going to leave and do something that's not this. And um, at that time, my dad was running a plumbing construction company. So he would, uh, he would do plumbing for high rises, apartment buildings, whatever. And so he had invited me to work with him to uh, reverse that and start uh, in the service business, in the plumbing service business. And I was like, look, I don't have anything else right now. I definitely know I don't want to do school. And I have my own dreams and aspirations that I want to accomplish in the future. But I think this is a good start for me to like just learn about business and like and help grow it. And so, you know, when I had joined, we had one guy. Wow. And we were super in debt. Um, it was, it's actually a kind of a crazy story. Uh, we, we had like, <laughs> I remember having this, uh, like little poster up above my desk where I sat in the warehouse. It wasn't even an office. It was just a straight up warehouse with like a ton of material and whatnot. And the poster said negative $34. And I remember in my head thinking like, I never want to be in that spot again. Cause it's just, it felt so brutal when you, when you know that it's, you, you don't know where your next meal is going to be, you know? Um, and a lot of people don't know that. Like, there's only a very, very limited amount of people that actually live through that time with me. And so, fast forward a year, um, we were able to generate uh, three quarters of a million dollars in uh, gross revenue. Wow. And then, uh, upon, I think, the second year, or two, maybe two and a half years in, we were at $3 million in revenue. So, uh, we grew pretty quickly because, again, I had no option. I'm like, I was just hungry and I had just kept my head down. And I think, honestly, though, th that two years of my life was the hardest I had ever experienced. Because, like I said, it's it's not only, like, it, you feel so discouraged because you have nothing to start with. Like, yeah. you have no resources. And you just, you have to, your brain goes into, like, survival mode and you have to figure it out. And so uh, I did that for seven years. And um, thus far, from, from the time that I've moved on from that, which is now three years ago, my dad has started a heating and cooling department and... You know, he's doing really well by himself. Yeah. But yeah, so that was my that was my origin wow. story. And there's there's a lot more to it. And there is, you know, there's been some f***ed up stories. And, you know, it really, it really taught me a lot. And in that moment, it was sink or swim, like really sink or swim. And uh, luckily, I was able to figure it out. How so. old were you when you decided to join your dad? I was, uh, I want to say 18. 18, about to turn 19 or like just around 19. And so yeah. you're sitting here. You're in school. You said community college, right? Yeah. And you said, 
the dreams you had were different already from the dreams of the people around you. What were those dreams? What did you want to do? I didn't know specifically at the time, and maybe I had an idea, you know, but definitely not what these people, I mean, these people that were in school wanted to get a degree, get a job, have a nine to five, have a family. There's nothing wrong with that at all. If that's what those people wanted, that's great for them. But that's not what I wanted. So, yeah, I, I decided to leave. And you mentioned sitting there with that poster showing negative money. The debt that you've taken on, it's just your dad and yourself. I can only imagine, you said it's a sink or swim mentality. Let's fast forward to over seven years later. You have millions of followers. You're well known. You have businesses. You have so much more than what you had before. If the two of you can meet today, what do you think your reaction would have been, younger you? That's a really good question. We kind of touched on this a little bit before, but I, I, I know that the younger me would I, it'd be disappointed, I think. Wow. Honestly, I do. Uh, because I remember clearly, like even at that time, thinking to myself, thinking of these goals that I wanted to have by certain ages that I wasn't able to accomplish. And certainly if you were to tell me at 27 years old, I, I would be where I am right now, which is great. Like everyone has their own timeline, you know, totally. everyone has their own journey. But if you were to tell me that at 27, I'd be here where I am now. I'd be like, damn, that sucks. Like you put in all this fucking work and effort and you're still just there. That's what I would think. That it's not enough. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't think it's enough, but not because like it's not enough, but because I just, again, it's everybody has their own timeline. Everyone has their own journey. Everyone's goals are different. Mine is different from yours. And in my own world, what I'm doing is is not enough, and I'm not there yet. What do you think would be enough? You know, I don't know. That's a great question. I I I think I'll know when I know. Yeah. And that's it. Simple as that. I'll just know when I know. I also grew up really poor. Yeah. And similar to your story where after just a few years, you went from in debt to making over 750K in revenue to making millions of dollars in revenue. We started poor because my dad was initially just an immigrant and just looked for jobs that he could get. Same here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> what brought him to the States in the first place? Uh, so the Soviet Union was falling apart yeah. at that time. So actually, I was born in Belarus. Wow. I was born in Belarus. My dad was born in Belarus. My mom was born in Russia. And um, we had immigrated here when I was three years old. Yeah. So yeah, my dad, same thing. Um, not to like steal the, the light no, away. No, I want to hear. Not to steal the light away from your story. Same thing, though. I'm sure your dad experienced it as well. But Domino's driver, I mean, he was a fucking puppeteer at one point. Yeah. Everything that he can do and anything that he could do to feed our family he would and yeah i think my, my work ethic definitely comes from him because it's like again in that time it was a sink or swim mentality what was he doing previously when he was in belarus what was he studying what were his dreams back then so he um originally was in the military uh he was in the air force and then after that he would do i, mean, I don't really know exactly what he did overseas but some sort of um commerce like uh, buying, reselling, buying, reselling. Yeah. He's doing business. Doing business back Hustling. then. Yeah, yeah. When he moved to the States, was it a mixture? Sounds like, well, Eastern Europe, just a lot of bad things going on. Was he already with your mom at that point too? Yes. Yeah, he, he's been with my mom since I think uh, 19... Wow. 90, I think. Holy so yeah. he's coming from Belarus. Your mom's coming from Russia. They have you, the yeah. kid. They're coming to the United States. They know nobody. And your dad just does every single fucking job he can to try and support his family. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really crazy. Um, not a lot of people experience and, like, see what I saw. Yeah. And I'm sure what you saw as well. And, you know, that's one reason that, like, I really work hard is I, I just want... My ultimate goal is to provide for my family the way that they did for me, but 10x, you know. I don't, I want to retire my parents. That I don't want them to ever work again. I want them to have, like, a, a seriously luxurious life, you yeah. know. 
And that's, that's what I want to get to. I'm not there yet, but soon. You mentioned that he was a puppeteer even. Yeah. Yeah. He used to, he used to do, uh, I don't know where, but you know, little shows for kids. Yeah. I think when you're a kid, you don't realize, hey, the way I'm living life is different from how other people are living life. Like this is just the way it is. And then as time goes on, you're like, oh, <laughs> they worked really, really hard. Yeah. And there's like a little bit of an obligation, I feel. Totally. To have made it worth it. Totally. My dad, for context, he, when we first moved to North America, he worked in a nuclear power plant. Oh, wow. Where'd you, uh, where'd you come from? So you- my parents are from Shanghai. I grew up initially in Canada. Oh, wow. Yeah. And a small town, like 3000 people and a bunch of nuclear power plants. And my dad was just working in the plants as like a technician. Yeah. And my mom was like, can we not raise our kids next to nuclear active (laughs) race? And he's like, that's not a bad point. So we moved to the States. I actually grew up in Indiana where we moved around a bunch of times. And the long story short is growing up, the number one most important thing for me in life period was money. Like it was drilled into myself from a young age that, hey, my parents worked really hard to get me here. I need to go and make tons of money. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what that is. It doesn't matter what the things I want to do are, I just need to go do it. And I think the biggest thing I've been trying to unlearn over this past decade is me trying to fulfill what they did for me by focusing on maybe what they needed actually is probably not the best way to honor it because it's yeah, a good point. Like they worked so hard and they wanted me to also go and make money, but it's precisely because they've gotten me this far. I get to you know, think about more. Like, I feel that weird mix of like, I want to work really hard and get a lot of things, but I'm feeling an increasing obligation to myself. Well, I can't be miserable. It has to be something I actually enjoy in itself. And that's, that's new for me. I always feel guilty. Yeah. Having that part of myself now. Yeah. I can relate to that. Like, I think sometimes my dad even lives through me. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe that plumbing is something that he wanted to do per se but it is something that provided for the family and something that he made a business out of and it's very hard to leave that when it's working Mm. so i I can relate to that and totally like yeah i can see him it's almost i feel i almost feel bad him seeing me do what i love to do yeah you know you mentioned off camera that you've constructed your life in some ways so that you can do business doing what you actually enjoy yeah i think that's the only way to live yeah. It's the only way to live. How did you get there from, holy f- I'm working in plumbing and I am in debt and I've got to do f***ing anything I can to get out of it yeah. too, you know, and I have to prioritize what I care about too. Yeah. I think it's just a decision you have to make and it was a really tough one for me. Yeah. But you just have to sit down with yourself and look yourself in the mirror and be like, look, what the f*** am I doing? Like, what do I want to do? It's simple as that. What do you want? That's it. There's nothing else to it. It's what do you want? And like that sometimes comes with, comes with repercussions, right? Because what you want isn't necessarily going to make you what you need. But you find ways around those obstacles, whether it's, uh, you know, another job. Like for, I'll give you an example. If someone's working at an um, auto body shop, nothing against auto body techs yeah. because I actually love auto body. But just as an example, someone's working at an auto body shop, they're like, I fucking hate replacing tires. Fuck this. I want to go be uh, a photographer. And... My suggestion for that person would be like, look, figure it the fuck out and go be a photographer. Figure out how to make money on the side while still doing what you do, whether it's fucking replacing tires or whatever it is, and go be a photographer, dude. Like, do it until it becomes a full-time job. But definitely, definitely, definitely do not do what you fucking hate to do every day. That is the, that's the worst way to live. It reminds me, there's this essentially modern-day philosopher which in these days is basically an author or a content creator named Mark Manson. He said that so much of living life is choosing the shit you're willing to go through. Like no yeah. matter what you do, there's going to be some shitty parts. Frankly, if there weren't shitty parts, I think it'd be hard it to find meaning. It wouldn't be meaning. enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. It's just about choosing the type of shit you want to go through. Like say, as you said, you're in an auto body shop. You want to become a photographer. Become a photographer, it's really risky. There's a certain type of shittiness you have to go through to try and make it. But you're also choosing... If you stay in the auto body shop, there's just a different type of shittiness you have to go through. And I love your point around, it's a choice. You get to choose 
Yeah. What's the shitty part I want to go through and what's going to make it meaningful for me? And I picture you there. I mean, you said you literally spent how many years in plumbing? Seven. Seven years in plumbing. That could yeah. have been your life. The business was scaling. You just said your dad added on literally like HVAC heating units. Yeah. Why? What was that process like leaving? Did you literally just quit one day, go to your dad, say, hey, I can't do this anymore? Or was it just gradually just declining? Uh, yeah. I mean, it was definitely... It was it was a lot harder than just, hey I quit. It yeah. was it was a lot of conversations, and I think at the end of the day, my dad wants me to be happy too. Yeah. And your question was, you know, why didn't you continue doing it? My heart wasn't in that. I didn't want to do it. And like I said before, you don't want to do something you don't want to do. Figure it out. Go do something else. And mm -hmm. that's what I did. And was that next thing was it YouTube or was it something else in between? No. So. Um, YouTube was never, uh, that was never the goal for me. Yeah. Um, I think that my following and any presence that I have online is solely due, at least right now, to the fact that uh, David Dobrik, my, my friend, promotes me or, and or has promoted me in his, mm. in his uh, YouTube videos. It wasn't past. even something you've intentionally built up. It's just no, no, due to your no. own friendships that's naturally built. Occurred. Yeah. So yeah. So that was like a byproduct of just being friends with Dave, the, mm. the followers, and my my intention when I moved out to Los Angeles was to start a uh, creative agency with Natalie and with David. And so, mm. <clears throat> kind of taking a step back from that, we looked at it and said, "There's a lot more opportunities here. There's a lot more on the plate. Let's focus on what we have and expand that, aka Dobrik's Pizza, yeah. and not work on the creative agency, which is what we did. Dobrik's Pizza and Zila." Yeah. In some ways, different businesses entirely made a joke earlier where one helps you stay in shape and other helps you get out of it. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever met any entrepreneur who's doing something in fitness and food. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm definitely, I'm definitely different. <laughs> and you're doing both at the same time. I'll tell you, I've done Carrot now for over four years. Yeah. 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 I don't know what I'm doing half the time. <laughs> and we just raised a f ton of money, $70 million. Yeah. I'm fully aware because we raced it. That's not our money. Yeah. And the chances that we fail is still uncomfortably high. Yeah. And I can only imagine you have two businesses. Yeah. Plus they're being done with your friends. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I think um, is a big differentiator yeah. is that we didn't raise any money mm. for, for either you still business. have control of your own companies there's pros and cons to it the cons yeah. are that all the pressure is on you and that you really have to scramble and bootstrap at, at certain yeah, times you literally have to make profit yeah you yeah you have to be which is a great thing because it really it it makes you think differently when you it's yeah. your own money and you're like i'm either spending it correctly or i'm not gonna be able to afford rent mm -hmm. <laughs> you know well, you're, you're spending it differently uh the the con to it is that the the scalability Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me another con to it is the scalability of it is yeah. much um less than if we were to raise money and again the pro is you're in control and you don't have to answer to anybody yeah um it's something i may do in the future but i think right now that's kind of where we're at what prompted the shift away from the creative agency i, I just think like i said there was more things to focus on on the plate mm. and instead of adding more and not doing what was already started we had just decided to do the things that were already in negotiations and talks. I also kind of love when I started to carry it, it was with my best friend. And now four years later, we do co-founder therapy every day. It's basically couples therapy. But That's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Every day? Not every day, every week. But every day we try and have time where we go through and practice what our therapists slash that is coaches so taught us. Cool. Dude, I feel like, well, oh, wow, thank you. Dude, I feel like I'm married to him. Yeah, I have. So um, David is a co-founder in Zila, but uh, more on like the investment uh, advisory side, not so much like the day-to-day. -day. Sure, operating. Yeah. But my operating uh, person, like the person who really helps me a lot, his name is Alex, and he's a hometown friend. And same thing. It feels like someone actually said, uh, someone asked me, like, how often do you see Alex? I'm like, dude, he's like my boyfriend. <laughs> like, yeah. It's it's really Every like that. Day. Every day. for I'm texting him nonstop. I mean, calls, meeting. Yeah. I mean, he's in everything. How did you and Alex meet? You said hometown friends. Yeah, Alex and I met a while, probably in like the sixth grade. A Holy while. shit. Oh, 
a while Dude, ago. I don't even think I remember the people I went to sixth grade with, and you yeah. are running a business with them. Well, what's funny is uh, John, our other hometown friend that lives here, that um, moved from from Vern Hills. He, I've known him since he was probably nine, nine years old. And another person, I may be hiring uh, for a facility, a DEXA facility that we have opening up in West Hollywood. Oh, you measure your body fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. That stuff. Yeah, so we have that facility yeah. opening up uh, probably in August. Yep. I'm hiring my to run that facility. I'm hiring a friend, hiring a friend also for my hometown. I have known him probably since I was seven. And John, wow. John, the other guy I was just talking about, I I am responsible partially for for teaching him English. Like that's how long I, my crew and I have known each other. Alex, John, what's the name of your third friend? Eric, and then Dave, and then Natalie. So those are all the Alex, people. John, Eric, and then of course Dave, Dave Natalie. and Natalie. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it's the wild. story I'm forming of you right now, as I'm getting to know you, dude, that loyalty. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I think it's all about loyalty. I, I really do. I mean, because a lot of people say don't go into business with your friends. Obviously, I did not follow that, but you've <laughs> taken that to another level. Yeah, it's fucking wild. I, I well, here's the thing: like, when you hire on people that you've yeah. known, they're very unlikely to fuck you over yes it's trust you know and there's again there's cons to it where you know you may fight or your relationship may be a little bit different there's sometimes where you oh, may feel yeah, disrespected yeah. because you're 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 trying to enforce yourself as a businessman but they're your friends so yeah. they're like fuck you no it's like you no know? you should be treating me better because we're close not yeah. worse yeah yeah and so so yeah it's it's definitely hard sometimes but um, I will say I am I got so sick and fucking tired of hiring people and having uh, my employment turnover rate high where I was like, look, if I hire the right people, spend time on it and or hire my friends, I'm less like much wow. less likely to fire them. That is incredible. And first, I agree with you. I think trust like I trust well with my life. Like, yeah, man, the other day. So I really appreciate, by the way, when I told you we did therapy, your response wasn't like, that's fucking weird. No, I love that shit, dude. Like, I think people should talk more. I actually Thank try you, to have, man. I try to have bi-weekly meetings with my employees one-on-one -on -one. Yeah. as a therapist, like me being the wow. therapist being like, yo, you just tell me how you feel. That's all I want to know. F work. Like, tell me how you feel. I fucking love that. Yeah. And I wish more people did it. And even though I do this now, there's still a small part of me that's afraid because that's not how standard business goes. Yeah. No, I, that's the most important. That's the most important. Open communication and not having any yeah. animosity in your business is so crucial. Yes. So crucial. I don't know if Carrot's going to succeed, but I feel good about my relationship with my co-founder. Yeah. <laughs> don't put that on air. No, <laughs> no. I'm very honest. I don't know if by Carrot's doing By doing a venture-backed business, yeah. I've told, it's funny, we have a lot of creators, as I mentioned, a couple of our friends who yeah. come in as angels. I tell every one of them, I'm most likely going to lose this money. <laughs> not because I'm not trying my off yeah yeah because venture back businesses are inherently incredibly risky yeah and i want you to know that because i care about the relationship so no i'm totally comfortable letting everybody know guys i'm trying hard <laughs> i don't know but nobody knows though exactly but nobody the most knows. important thing is my relationship with my co-founder yeah. i want to go back you said you have bi-weeklies with your employees where you listen to their feelings i love that yeah because i think in business it's almost like there's undercurrents there's what you see on the surface. People might disagree and they don't know if they go in the direction you say, but underneath it's always just the feelings. It's always just the emotion because when you strip everything down, yeah. you strip all the bull down, they're just a human. Yes. You know? I love that. We yeah. did this exercise. So we brought in, we haven't done this before. We brought in a coach and he ran us through this exercise. He said that there's a big difference between recognition and appreciation. He said, recognition is gratitude expressed for something you did. Like, hey, Ilya, I really am grateful for you coming into this pod with me today. And you're super on time, super engaged, great. But he said, appreciation is when you feel gratitude for them just as a person. Like, Ilya, I appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to be emotionally real with your friends and the people you work with. Like, that's not like a thing. That's just you as a person. Yeah. We did this exercise. We took eight leaders of the company. We sat them down. And every person, we'd say, you're going to sit there. We're going to tell you what we appreciate about you for two minutes, three minutes straight. And you can't say anything, but just look us in the eyes and say thank you. Dude, it was f***ing insane. Really? Like, I don't know. How do you do when you hear praise? When people tell you, like, hey, man, I love that you did this. Like, do you feel good? Do you feel weird? I actually don't like praise for myself. Yeah. 
I don't like it. I don't either. Yeah, it's I think weird. It's, it's weird, and it's like I much have I much I'd much rather my results show for themselves. You know, because it's like I haven't earned this. Let me show you. Yeah, yeah. But like, actually, the the yeah. Zila slogan is "Show, don't tell." So, yeah. Wow, that's very in line. You weren't kidding. Yeah. Your business, your life, your motto, your friends, yep. it's all together. Yep. It's all, yeah. But, like, imagine, right, Alex, Sean, Eric, Dave, Natalie, they're sitting down, and, dude, they're just telling you what you, they appreciate about you. Yeah, no, f*** that. <laughs> like, yo, like, I'm about feelings, <laughs> I'm but good, man. I'm going to listen to your feelings. I don't need this for yeah, me. I'm good, yeah. Dude, I'm it good. felt really, I felt scared. Yeah. Because... You know, it's funny. They did it for my co-founder first, and they said so many lovely things, mainly around he's grown tremendously as a manager. I trust Will more yeah. than I trust myself on the hiring side, which honestly sounds like you spend a lot of time thinking about as well. Yeah. My co-founder, Will, cares more about people than anything, and yeah. I, I love that. And then it was my turn. They're like sharing appreciation with me, and I was like, F what are people going to say? Because I realized <laughs> if I care what they say, even when it's positive, I'm now accepting to myself that I care. Yeah, I care in general. <laughs> yeah that's funny it's like you say something nice to me i can't accept that without being like honestly dude so what's funny um bella who's our one of our producers yeah. for the documentaries we were on a podcast the other day and she was on it too and jason nash yeah. he asked bella he's like what do you think about Ilya?" i'm like oh god here we go and she starts naming shit off and i can't even look at her i'm like looking at the ground because i'm like i can't i don't want to hear it you know what i mean it's that's so weird tense. yeah yeah like I'll tell you this, growing up, the way my parents expressed their love for me was through acts of service. It was not yeah. by words of affirmation. Yeah. yeah. And I think I internalized that. That's how I feel good. And so it feels really weird when someone's just saying, hey, man, I appreciate you for this. Yeah, maybe I, now, I think, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe that's the reason that I overcompensate. And try to hear what other people have to say because I know that it's important to them, but to me, when other people say things and compliment me, like we were just talking about, I'm like, I, I just, I, I can't hear it. See, what I, what I kind of love is, as you said, you care a lot about other people feeling heard to the point you have bi-weeklies with your employees just being like, just tell me what you think and feel. Yeah. But what I'm sensing is, if someone came to you and said that, how would you feel about that? If someone came to me and was like, I want to have a yeah. Um. I, I don't know. I, don't, I think I'd be like, no, I'm okay. You know, I'm good. I'm good. I don't want to. Um, I just, I have so much bullshit pent up. You don't want to hear it. Like, mm -hmm. it's too much for you to handle as mine. Because the stresses you have as founder. Yeah, it's like, it, you, they, nobody's able to handle what I have to say. Like, no one. Except for myself. Really no one. So when, when I sat through this exercise, and I had people just sitting there appreciating me. Yeah. Dude, it was like, there are tears in my eyes. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like, you're gonna sit here and you're gonna be appreciated. My <laughs> operations literally said, you always, Eric, you always ask me how I'm doing, but you never tell me how you are. Yeah. It's the same as you. Yeah, man. Yeah. I don't know, it's just, it's part of the job, you know? It's making sure your crew's good. It's making sure your your troops are, your people. Your people are well, well fed, well, maintain happy everything you know that's it's that's your job that's the responsibility that you take on as a leader wait so you're still dating the same the first person you ever dated you're still with them with my founder oh you're first like, talking about no 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 i oh, no. had four or five women I oh what are you talking about no no i'm not my fifth co-founder no, Will, if you're hearing this, you were the only one always for me. No. Oh, your father is on my I'm saying, I'm still on my birds. Will's my, I love how I just undercut everything I just said. And I'm like, wow, this guy's not sniffing. <laughs> this guy. No, no. I'm still with Will. I'm still with my okay, 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 okay. But I've had your four or five personal okay, relationships. Okay, okay. No, I, haven't had, I haven't had a relationship since uh, I was 19. Dude, you're like, you are like my go -find. He's the same. His last relationship was in college. Yeah, man, I don't know. It's just, it's a lot for you to take on right now. And I think when the time is right, I'll know when I'm either more freed up, I have my ducks in a row. I, and you know, I'm at a place where I, I not only want or not only need, but yeah, want a girlfriend, you know, I really think for you, it's want a girlfriend because dude, I mean, you have so much f***ing love in you that you are still with your sick, great friends and doing yeah. business with them. Yeah. 
No, there's, yeah, well, I think, like I said, loyalty is, is so crucial. I agree. I have had a lot of founder friends where their company fails not because they ran out of money, but because they just hate each other. Yeah, you know what I got? I have a good book for you. Yeah. Um, it's called some, it's called something about hiring, like hiring the right people or the hiring, something. Yeah. I'll give it to you. It's incredible. And in the book, it, the number is crazy. It's like 80% of businesses fail due yes. to the fact that there's improper management and the core and foundation of it is, is broken yeah. because of the people, not because the money was misspent. You can always get money. You can always you, get you money. You don't trust your partner. Yeah. So you and Alex, right? Yeah. You mentioned he's the operating partner you were working with. Was it Zilla or Dobrix? For Zilla. For Zilla. Yeah. So if you did have them sitting there by the side, like what are the ways that you complement each other? And like, what are the things you appreciate about him? Yeah, I think he's very, he has, he's one of the uh, most consistent people that I've ever met. Yeah. And one of the most hardworking, which is kind of crazy because, you know, I don't know how I was so lucky to have him be my friend, plus also have him be one of the hardest working people I know. Wow. And have him be one of the most consistent people I know. Like, oh, it's great. just, it's fucking crazy. Like, it really is. And if I lost him, I wouldn't know what the Truly, truly would not. What do you think, I'm going to push you on, so what do you think he appreciates about you? I would say, you know, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Because I think I'm, I'm, I'm hard on him sometimes, sometimes not. I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough to say. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I know the good, I know the good in me, you know? I think what he, well, he really... I think what he would say is like, I, I like the lady because he just ultimately at the end of the day wants to help people. Like that's it. I love that. I also will say instantaneous what you appreciate about Alex, but you know, Alex is a smart, good person. He clearly would work with you because he appreciates you as well. Yeah. Dude, I've heard more I don't knows in that 15 seconds yeah. than the rest of the time I've known you ever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's tough. What, uh, what about, um, because obviously, Will and I, we argue a lot, but we've learned how to play nice. We've learned to argue in ways that show the respect and trust and love that we have for each other. Yeah. I think Alex and I are good at that. Yeah. I think we, we rarely get into fights. And even if we do, um, we don't have grudges. That's important. You can't always hold on to what happened in the past. Yeah. That's what is, would really poison. The relationship moving forward is a grudge. So, yeah, we don't really fight though. I I just don't want to put that on anybody else's shoulders. I don't want my own pressure is my own pressure, and I've learned to, and I also suggest not necessarily suffering in pain by yourself. I don't suggest that, but there's a certain there's you have to take it to a certain extent of like everybody's got problems, and sometimes you just got to deal. Sometimes, and some of the stuff that I would lay on to Alex, for example, or whoever else, they just simply would not, not only not understand it, but just don't need to hear it. They just don't need to hear it. And there's nothing that I can do about it. There's nothing that they can do about it. Some things are just, it is what it is. And yet if Alex has problems, you're willing to listen. But I'm sure he also yeah. thinks the same way. I'm sure he also goes, you know, I'm not gonna tell you about my, my whatever, in this situation. Yeah, you're you both know, regulating a little bit. You're not sharing yeah. yeah, we're not like dumping on each other and our all of our all of our stuff that we have in our head. Okay. Yeah. So but th don't get me wrong, like I'll talk to Alan and tell him like what I feel about certain things, but yeah. there's it goes so far beyond I don't know if it does for him, but for me it certainly goes so far beyond the surface level stuff that I verbally say. I kinda like that. I've always thought of it as you know, you mentioned suffering, right? And I've gone back and forth whether suffering is a virtue in itself or it is a needed and inevitable process of getting to what you need. Yeah. And I think of suffering too, because one of the very first things when you came in, it's like, hey man, you look like you're in shape. And I was like, well, you do too. Yeah. Working is painful. Yeah, it is. For sure. It is suffering incarnate. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen this before, but it's like you either suffer uh, to make yourself better or you suffer because you didn't make yourself good. I've never read that before. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So it's, 
you, you choose your route. It's like you're either going to suffer because of the regret that you have, or you're going to suffer getting to your goal. And I'd rather suffer getting to my goal than regretting something. For me, I think there's a part of me that embraces the suffering and pressure. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. You have to. You can't look at it as a, a negative or as a disadvantage. You have to have it. If you're not suffering, that's why I almost like, not that I don't like people that aren't self-made. Yeah. I just look at them a much different way. I, I look at them uh, with the respect of like, okay, yeah, they're just a person. They, you know, they were dealt with that, with the cards that they were dealt with. That's that. Yeah. But I'm not going to do business necessarily with a person that's not self-made and or have the same emotional connections. If they just don't know what the f I went through, you know, or anybody that's self made yeah. The same framing you use that hand of cards, I think of it the same way. We've all been dealt a hand of cards and some cards are better than others. We all start with different amounts of privilege. What matters is what you do with it. Yeah. 100%. And yeah, I think there is to add on to that, all of us who grew up super poor, <laughs> there's a little f***ed up part of us that yep. never, ever wants to be there again. <laughs> no, you, no, 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 I'm good. Yeah. All right, well, on that note, <laughs> so we're going to, we're, we're going to play a little bit game. Okay. It's called 36 questions to fall in love. Okay. The New York Times wrote a study about this. They took these random pairs of people, put their questions all around two things. Number one is vulnerability. I'm going to share something about myself. Number two is reciprocity. Please share back instead of shitting on me. Okay. And at the end of it, many of these pairs became good friends. One pair did end up getting married. Wow. So, you know, actually, you and I, like, maybe. We'll see. That's <laughs> the uh, room. That's the infection. Okay. Yeah, Alex better watch it. I know, right? So, there's three levels of questions. Okay. We're going to start with eye contact. I'm going to count down from three to one. We're going to make eye contact. The first person to look away or blink, mm -hmm. they're going to pull the first card from level one. And then we'll do a couple from each level. So it's a staring contest. Wait. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Three, two, one. Did you have eyes like an eagle? Has anyone ever told you that? No. Razor sharp. Thank you. Okay, I blink first. <laughs> All right, level one. What about me is most strange or unfamiliar to you? And it's good because you're getting to know each other. Yeah, I think it's interesting that when you transition between thoughts, yeah. you take a breath through your nose instead of either saying um or ah uh, or just pausing. Holy f you're perceptive. <laughs> You're right. First of all, second, growing up, I was scared of talking to other people. We moved around a lot. Like I said, I grew up in Canada, in Indiana, I think in our fourth grade, we moved around every single year. And I, you know, I'm new in town, I don't know anybody. Every grade, it's different people. I was really scared of socializing. In fact, I'm still a decently socially anxious person. Yeah. I accept that because I think that same anxiety can also make me really good in certain situations yeah. and I spend a lot of time learning how to talk part of that was sitting down one day and I said every single time I stumble and I say a filler word or I say a flub or I say a mistake I punish myself mentally now there's a lot of pressure when we even started this pod I made a small flub and I'll tell you Leah I've done this over 30 40 50 times this is the first time ever I've ever made a flub like that wow and I think if you want me totally honest about yeah. why, dude, I was and am so excited to get to know you better because I feel like I've seen you around here and there we chatted, yeah. but I'm legitimately, I had this feeling. I'm like, no sane person would go and like, you know, the plumbing business, you know, what you've done via content, start multiple businesses, unless you like really care. Yeah. And those are the types of people I try to surround in my life people who care and work really hard. So I was really excited. And then I flipped the line. I said, yeah. there's a lot of that. And to your point, what you've noticed, I spent years training myself. You have to, at the end of the day, if you don't have anything, you gotta learn to be able to speak. You gotta learn how to be able to talk. Yeah, that's, I, I agree. I, super important. What's funny is you don't do many of those verbal fillers or stumbles, I think. I think it's because I've done 
the podcast thing for yeah. quite a bit now. So I know it gets annoying and I know people don't want to hear like, um, like, 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 you know, you've just quickly, <laughs> just by doing it, just dissect race it. <laughs> if, if I had answers for you, what about you is most strange or unfamiliar? I think many people who go through your background and upbringing, hey, grew up poor, had to work really f- hard, grew up in an environment where Hey, maybe people aren't praising you and giving you little pats on the back all the time. Taking a lot of suffering, a lot of discipline onto yourself are often not the most emotionally accepting and aware people as well. I was surprised when I started to talk about co-founder therapy and your reaction was literally, it was li- up to that point, the most interested I've seen you, you were like, wait, that's incredible. Yeah. And I was like, I felt surprised. Yeah. Because I was like, typically people who come from that background like yours, they don't have that same willingness to embrace the emotional aspect of what we do. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool. So follow-up question that, do you do therapy yourself? No, I don't. Yeah. Um, I do not do therapy. And I think there was this, I've had this stigma around it for a, a, a long time. And just the last couple of years, I've really come around to it and understood that it's totally not bad to talk about it. You, you're not like... You don't have to cry. You don't have to get emotional necessarily. You just, it's good to talk through what your thoughts are and just release. Dude, these are strong Ilya vibes. You celebrate when other people do therapy, but haven't done it yourself because you're still learning to overcome that fear and stigma. Right. To a certain extent. Totally. I'm the same way. For context, I didn't do therapy until right before I started Karen's. Because, dude, I grew up Asian. You know, when I was depressed, yeah, it's like, what the f- are you talking about? I'll follow you. Yeah, I had to, one time I was really depressed and like, I wasn't like going to my parents and telling them that. Yeah, or, sure. you know, whatever. Yeah. But my, my parents noticed and my dad was like, dude, stop being sad. Like, you're making your f- <laughs> sad. Stop being sad, you fucking bitch. <laughs> like, yeah. that's, yeah, yeah. But that's like, totally the worst part is he wasn't even like, trying to be mean about it. Totally. He's just like, stop being sad. sad. Like, you're sad. And then he wrapped in my mom. Your mom's sad too because of it. And I'm like, oh, now I'm feeling the guilt. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that just makes me even sadder. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't do therapy four years, even though similarly to you, I was always happy when other people did. I'm like, man, I love that for you. That yeah. you were willing. Look, it's just not for me. What changed was when I was 27, I had accomplished everything that I thought I wanted to lay out when it came to my dreams. I had gone to a great school. I had worked all these really prestigious companies. I was on Instagram. I was building Instagram live. It was a super cool role. I continued on that path. I'd be financially secure, working on interesting problems with interesting people. And I felt like shit because I've been suppressing this more creative. I actually do want to do something of my own. I want to be something I integrated into my life and do with my friends. And suppressing that for the longest time. So it's like, that's not the risk safe path to making sure that I never end up where I was growing up. So I quit and I, I was so like messed up that I started therapy. Cause I was like, you know, I was like, why not? Like, I don't know what the f- I'm doing. And I was skeptical, but I stuck with it. I'm very good at discipline. I was like, you know what? I'm going to stick at least like four or five sessions. This is going to be a thing now. The same way I'm going to go to the gym and work out. I'm in at least five sessions and I did start to think of it as it's like a personal fitness coach put for your mind. And I think doing therapy directly helped the, it helped lead me to doing caring. It was that same year. Yeah. That's dope. So, um, how did you, how did you start caring? Like, who, who had the idea? How did you start it? What was the, yeah. what was your original roadmap? Cause I, I really don't know much about totally. it. Yeah. So, our mission is everyone now is making content and so many people are learning how to make money in businesses from that as well. Like even you, you mentioned, you said for your goals, like build an audience. That was just by being friends with David. Yeah. And part of the reason why you started doing Zilla and Dobrix was because you were like, I have this audience. There's got to be things I can do with it. that are like my personal interests and the business perspective. I think as it becomes easier and easier to make content and there are more and more ways for people to find it, that's going to happen 10x. And then our mission is everyone who's going from the creator mindset to starting businesses, we take care of the questions around how do I incorporate? 
How do I do my taxes? How do I get access to credit? How do I set up a bank account? Yeah. How do I get a mortgage? Because today it's actually pretty hard. You're very savvy, but we've worked with a lot of creators who actually make six, seven figures and they don't pay their taxes. I know firsthand. I know I've dealt with people like that for sure. Yeah. So it's definitely smart of you to think about that. Or think of that. And like, there's a huge business opportunity here for sure. Personally, it was a mix of what I wanted to do, what my co-founder wanted to do. For me, I was like, gosh, if I grew up now, maybe I would have gone into something more entrepreneurial and creative from the start. I did it because I was scared. I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And if I can help the people doing that now, help make a future where that's more possible so that the next version of me could go straight into that rather than spending years just floating around me a cocky machine. I care about that. Well, like I said, you look 24, so you're, <laughs> you're good still. Dude. Thank you, dude. And my co-founder, for him, it was more the financial piece. He's, even when he was 19, he raised millions of dollars from a venture capital fund. Wow. And that's not because he's rich as fuck. Here at, you know, middle class, whatever. Went to Stanford. He went around to all the rich parents of his classmates. And he oh, said, you wow. guys have tons of money. What else, And he said, you guys have tons of money, parents. Yep. You want to invest it. I know the top students building startups here at Stanford, but I don't have money. So give me five, 10 mil of your money and I'll invest it for you and I'll take the spot back. He did this, he was like 19, 20. And for him, that part around how do I get money from the people who have it to the people who need it? That's his reason for doing Carrot. Now, starting from that idea, we were best friends for years, kind of like you yourself, right? Everyone you mentioned, John Hanks, there's a lot of trust there already. Yeah. So we wanted to do something. And then we realized very early on that for something like this, you have to raise money. Most financial technology companies, you don't make money for a very long time. We're not profitable today, yeah. right? Our credit card product, we don't charge you fees. We make a little bit from the processing fee, but really we're doing, because we hope you use the card, you might use this for other services down the road, like taxes, your bank accounts, or mortgages. So you have to raise a lot initially. My co-founder and I, we made that decision, we're gonna do this type of company, because we also considered bootstrapping. As you said in the very beginning, it's just a different type of business. You have a lot more control, and you don't need to take money from other people and it's harder in its own way. We said, we're going to take this very small shot at building a billion dollar company and we're going to have to raise money to do this. And fuck, like we're going to, we're going to try, we're going to be committed. The first check we ever got was from the co-founder of Twitch, because I realized when you try and raise money from other people, you can't actually convince anyone to give you money for something they don't believe. In. You just have to find the people who already believe in what you're doing. Totally. And just convince them you're not going to f it up. Yeah, I, I, I agree hundred percent. I think it all comes down to like, it does that person see your vision? When I first heard about Zila, I thought it was really cool because you've been building content into it from the start. And like, that's just literally how anyone anywhere these days, like, do I want to work with a fitness coach? Do I want to learn how to get more shape? Why wouldn't I go with the guy who's doing it for all the people I trust? Yeah. And there are a lot of people out there, everything you describe, someone would probably think it's bullshit, but that's exactly why you have an opportunity too. Anything that's an opportunity, half the people out there think it's brilliant and half the people out there think it's stupid. <laughs> Otherwise, it's already be done. Yeah. What is your first love's name and the reason you fell in love with him or her? <laughs> um, you know, to be honest, I don't know if I've ever been in love. And I tried to convince myself that I was. Uh, I dated a girl, her, her name was Tori. And dude, so long ago, it was like, I started dating her like sophomore year of high school. Dude, I thought you were gonna be like sixth grade, so. Yeah. Sophomore year of high school. And, um, yeah, that lasted for, I think, roughly three and a half, four years. And, you know, I obviously was with her every day almost. And yeah, I, I thought I, I thought I loved her. But at the end of the day, I don't know if I did, truly. I don't know if I ever have been. I want to be one day. And it's kind of crazy because you never know what, like, I feel like everyone's definition of love is a little bit different. And, you know, not to get all beaten, but... Um, Mine might be different from yours, and I don't know if I have been in love. Well, when I say the word love, like what are three words you think of? I think caring about the person more than you care about yourself. It's not three words, but I guess it's just to constantly caring. Yeah. Uh, wanting to be with them, no matter what. I guess like just 
just surrounding yourself with with their presence um and then obviously like physical attraction i think you gotta be physical attracts yeah otherwise you're just friends right so yeah i think those three so do you feel like at least the first couple caring about them more than you care about yourself wanting to be with us do you feel like you've experienced that at least platonically yeah i think so for sure and like with both men and women totally same yeah and it's that third part and then all of it together in that right. romantic context that's what you're not sure you've experienced yeah i think so I, yeah i don't know yet you know how about you first love <laughs> you've had like you said five or six different relationships so yeah. did, did you love each person yeah it's so funny. I'm dating somebody now and she's getting to know me. She like watched some of the podcasts. Yeah. She's like, who is this person? <laughs> and it's funny. I now realize the content that we produce here, literally, first of all, I like her very much. And yeah. I think, you know, I really think she can be the one. Yeah. But I'm just realizing anybody that I date ever will be listening and hearing these <laughs> until the end of time. That's something I've become newly aware of. I haven't made content for that long, right? right? And then now I have to. No, then it's on the internet. It's there forever. It's like, hey, you talked about this on your pod. Like, yeah. huh. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of my very first loves was actually a girl in college that I was super, super into and never actually told her that I was. Because in college, I basically had no friends. I didn't know what I was doing. And she was like my first friend. So I think. It wasn't like a healthy sort of love. It was just like a, well, you're my friend and I have no friends. So I am really good friends with you. And I, oh, I guess I'm romantically interested in you too. And she had a boyfriend though. Wow. And I was incredibly respectful. So I never, so respectful. She never even knew, right? It was just sort of like, a, oh, I'm like good friends with you, but maybe, okay, there's probably something more. I'm going to die. Does she have a boyfriend now still or do you not know? She's married. She's married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so opportunity is gone. Oh, yeah. I, no, this is like 10 over 10 years ago, oh, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that's passed. And I think I took a big lesson from that, which was if you're actually really interested in somebody, even if you're just friends, you have to ask. You owe that to yourself. Yeah. And even if it doesn't work out, like, that's fine. It's better than just being in the no man's land. I agree. You owe it to yourself to ask who gives a f. Exactly. Like, at the end of the day, if it's a no, then it's a no. You yeah. Know? As simple as that. But you've got to find out. You've got to find Have you ever been rejected in your life before? I've definitely been rejected. Okay. I, don't, I don't think like... Not romantically per se, maybe. Uh, yeah, not in the sense of I, I, I think I love this person and I'm going to admit my feelings. And, yeah. Well, you know what? Actually, with Natalie, you know what? Obviously, you know Natalie. Yeah. That, was a, that was the biggest, I think, rejection that I've had mm-hmm. in terms of actually liking the person for more than just like a, a one night thing those feelings feelings are like very far gone in the moment because yeah. we've just like grown together as friends and as business partners but yeah during that time uh it was definitely a pretty big pretty big rejection and you know i didn't like feel bad about myself i was like yeah it is what it is if anything i need to if anything i need to like become the man that i want to be for the person that wants me for who i am you know I love that. And I actually believe men and women can be friends. You think so? A hundred percent. I think that, and I think it's totally, there are people I've asked that before. I said, no, like, we'll just be friends as well. Yeah. Right. I think in order for men and women to be friends, it goes back to the very first thing you said in your pocket. It has to be a choice. Like yeah. as a man, you have to consciously make the choice. Like I will just be friends with this person and respect the friendship. Yeah. Which, as guys, sometimes when we're single and we're getting to know people and we're becoming friends with someone, there's a part in our brains that's like, oh, am I interested in this person? Yeah. Right? Assuming both people are single and it's early and mm. you know what I mean? Is that yeah. for you? But I think as a guy, we can also choose to make a choice like, I'm not going to be interested in this person in this way. Yeah. Uh, I, I have come around to that as well during the last couple of years. Sure. What about from a... Business perspective, have you felt rejected before? Yeah, multiple, multiple times. I mean, during the first six months of uh, being in the plumbing business, all I did was search for new clients. And that's right, because you guys were dead. Yeah, so like a lot of cold calling, a lot of no's, a lot of what call you back, a lot of not getting back to you, a lot of empty promises, a lot, a lot, a lot of that.
So I've definitely been rejected and burned many times in business, but that's that, that's part of it. That's yeah. not, that's that, that stuff that stuff becomes easy. Describe your perfect day. Actually, this is a perfect day for me because yeah. I get to just do work that I enjoy. Work that I do not enjoy is meetings yeah. where I have to sit and decide what managers of managers should do. I'm really bad at that. It's uh -huh. too far removed from the core work. Yeah. And it's too focused on organizational strategy and people. I suck at that. My co-founder is way better. What I really love doing is, hey, I get to sit here with you right now, do this, get to know you better. I get to think about with Jay, hey, what's the content? What's the work we put out into the world? It feels tangible. Because at the end of it, I can point to it and be like, I helped work on that. That's an amazing day that I get to work on the things I enjoy. Yeah. What about yourself? Uh, my perfect day is when I get, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, but when I get all of my, not weird, but kind of cliche, when I get all of my tasks completed, but not only completed, but executed to a point of I don't have to look back at it or return to that task. So an example would be like doing, um, I don't know, sending somebody a proposal, like a uh, proposal for uh, employment and I send them the proposal but now I'm like oh, f man, I have to talk with my partner about this p part of the proposal and he's not back until tomorrow and it's like f man I wanted to send this today and as long as I'm getting like everything done in my day in my calendar that I've planned out and checked off I don't care what kind of day it is mm. that's my perfect day and the days that I, I'm not able to do that I feel like a, like such a slug I'm like Fuck, I wasn't able to do, to do this or this because 14 other things got in the way yeah. between this and this and and yeah so for you it's when something's hanging when you haven't been able to close yeah, it out I hate that because you gotta wait I hate it I'm the I same way I start something dude. if I can close it out yeah beautiful if yeah. I can't it stays yeah. in my head and I gotta remember yep yep okay yeah. I respect that yep level three baby what do you think I fear the most? Based on the information that I have yeah. from this hour that we've been talking, the fears that I think that you would have, you've covered yeah. pretty well. Either you've worked on them and or you're not behind the eight ball, you're in front of it, on it. So I really don't know. Um, and I yeah. don't want to give you an answer. I appreciate the honesty. Yeah, I, I don't want to give you an answer that I think... Um, is wrong, so therefore I don't know. But if you can tell me what you fear the most, maybe I can. I will let you know if I was what if yeah. what I was thinking is is what you said. I think for me, it's disappointing people, people that I know and care That's about. That's so fucking crazy. I'm not joking. That's exactly what I was thinking. The reason I didn't say it mm. is because you had mentioned something in the beginning where you said I'm very transparent about. Um, things that I do when I do business, when I, yeah. whatever, therefore there's, um, there's already an expectation of this might fail. Yes. Cause I want to be, that's why really I didn't clear. say it because, because of that reason. But in my head, I'm like, he's definitely scared of confronting people about, about something bad that happened oh, and totally. disappointing them. A hundred percent. Yeah. Why do I tell people, I'm like, Hey, we've raised money. We are venture back startup. We can fail. Yeah. It's because thinking about the disappointment <sighs> yeah we now you know in the early days if we failed it wouldn't have mattered no one would have given a fuck. right now we fail dude it's gonna be a whole thing <laughs> yeah like everyone's gonna be like oh my god like what did eric do wrong what yeah. did will do wrong like these fucking idiots they wasted the money like carrot was terrible all along we have investors we have clients employees yeah, you got Friends. a you got a lot on the line. Yes, you got a lot. Yes. You got a lot on your shoulders. A lot on the line, and yeah. and you know, to do something that I want to do, to do something meaningful, obviously we have to take on risk. Yeah, for you too, it's similar. You're doing these things with your friends out in public, and I know that, and I accept that, and I'm still terrified of disappointing people, and that's yeah. why I think people are like, oh yeah, like you're gonna kill it, right? And I'm like, I try and be. I'm not exaggerating. I'm just trying to be honest. It's like. No, I don't know. Like, I think <laughs> we have a very yeah. real shot at this. Yeah. And I care and believe in this enough to spend my own life on it, which is a high bar, simultaneously, and I don't know. Right. It's less, oh, I'm 100% confident. It's more, I've learned to work. 
I've learned how to work on things that I'm actually uncertain on because I think that's how you sometimes get to work on the coolest things. It's yeah. to be able to recognize that it might not work out and I still want to do it. Yeah. But yeah, that is a huge, not only professionally, even personally, when I date people, I'm always like, when I see something that like hurts your feelings, I'm, it just bothers me a lot. I'm just like, oh, I really fucked up. Yeah. 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 Well, now, now I got to guess. Oh, man, I got to guess for you. Yeah. What, what do you fear the most? I'm going to have a couple guesses Please. with the framing that, look, I don't know if they're right, but here are my two guesses. Okay. The first one is afraid of failure. Yes. Second guess of what you're afraid of is you mentioned at the beginning, if you at age 18, 19 met who you were at age 27, that you'd feel disappointed, that you haven't done enough and you're not there yet. I'm going to guess maybe there's a fear like, what if it's never enough? What if I never get there? What if I never accomplish enough that I feel like I've made it? Yeah, I think your first guess, um, fear of failure. I'm not afraid to fail. Mm. I am, I do not have a fear of failure. Okay. And to a certain extent, I understand that I will never fail at the end over the long run. I think trying and, and not succeeding is a success in of itself, mm. honestly. I so, love that. Yeah. I, I'm not afraid of failure and I have a very a high risk tolerance, which helps me a lot in my life. And I, in terms of, is it ever going to be enough? Definitely. I don't know if that's the most thing that I don't know if that's my biggest fear, but it's definitely a big fear of, mm. I don't know if it's ever going to be enough. I don't know. At one point I'm going to be like, man, okay, I'm good. I'm good now. And I think when that time comes, it'll come. But I, I, I yeah, it's definitely a big fear. What's your number one fear then? Not getting to a place in my life in time for my parents to reap the benefits of my labor. Yeah. That's my biggest fear. I think my friends will reap the benefits and the people I surround myself that are my age, but my biggest fear is not getting there in time for my parents. So, yeah. I get that. Yeah. It's just like, oh man. It's tough, man. It's really tough. Do you still stay in contact with them? Do you still talk with them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely very close with my parents. Yeah. That's I'm their great. only child, actually, Aww. which is another reason for me to like really, really, I'm, I'm all they got, man. That's nobody else. It's just me. It's, it's either me or nobody, you know? That's fucking scary. Yeah, it is. It's very scary. So every time I fuck up, I, I'm like, fuck. I'm that much further away now from accomplishing what I need for them. And that's a life where they just don't have to worry about anything. Zero. I mean, you're always gonna have to worry about something, but overall, generally speaking, mm. do they know that's your goal? I don't think so. I've never like sat them down and been like, this is my goal. I, th I think they see me work very hard. I think they see me make mistakes. I don't think that they understand though that I really am like my primary number one thing is that though yeah. that's my number one driver that's the reason i get up that's my number one thing wow yeah my friend once told me that the number of times we'll see your parents remaining in our lives it is a limited finite number yeah it really is i mean if you really think about it i don't know where your parents are but yeah you know, i see my dad and mom maybe out of the 365 days maybe 10 days of the yeah. year so take 10 and multiply that by x years like yeah. it is ticking down it's kind of crazy because when we're kids right we see them continuous ongoing yep always and as soon as we leave it becomes defined finite number and i'm terrified by that yep my parents are in new jersey i haven't seen them as much as i would like to and i think part of the reason is I'm scared when I see them how much older they look every time. Yes, I me see too, them. dude. I was on FaceTime my mom the other day. I'm like, Fuck, my mom's looking way older. Actually, Alex and I had that conversation the other day. Like, they're turning, they're, yeah, they're turning old, man. They're turning old, and I, I'd like, in addition to them seeing what I've done and you know creating that success, I'd, I'd like them to see that and, and be able to live that when they're still capable and to move around. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. It breaks my heart when I go back and I see, and it's just so different from how I remember them. Yep. Yep. 
<sighs> so I'm with you yeah. on that, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like, fuck. Yeah. Do you know if you want to have kids yeah. one day? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Have yeah. your own. I feel like, I'm not surprised. I feel like everything you've just described, what your parents worked for and passed on to you, it's something you want to give to them, but also yeah. to your own. Yeah. Absolutely. How does one earn your vulnerability? Um, I think by being relatable. I think anybody, right? Like, you're not going to share your feelings with somebody that, that doesn't understand. Yeah, that doesn't share back. Yeah. Every time I hear you talk about the people you care about, like your friends, the people you've grown up with, like, I even know their names now, right? Yeah. yeah. John, Alex, Eric, Daniel, yeah. and Allie, your family. Yep. Man, I feel far closer to you. I can see how much you care and love about them and what a big part yeah. of your life that is. And that's something I did not know yeah. from outside. And it's just like, wow, you really care. I do. Yeah, I just... My, my goal overall, man, you know, to be honest, now that we're talking about it, is um, I just want to help people, you yeah. know? Bottom line, at the end of the day, I just... I want... I want to treat everybody. I want to treat yeah. the people that deserve to be treated. I want to help people. That's it. That's it. You know? And I will sacrifice myself to do that, truly. I mean, I'm hearing you. Again, you celebrate other people during therapy, but you haven't done it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to do some, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I know. I'm going to be that friend <laughs> being like, I... You text me tomorrow. Yo, you yeah, hit that no. guy up yet? <laughs> you know, because I, I kind of love hearing you describe that. And it's almost like you find meaning in yourself by helping others. Yeah, totally. That's actually the perfect way to put it. That, that is my purpose. Yeah. That's my sole purpose. Wow. Yeah. That's incredibly powerful. I can't say I know a lot of people for whom, you know, we all like, you know, we're all humans. We all like want to be good human beings and help each other, but to that, that degree. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Last one. You pull it. Okay. Ready? Oh, you know it. Okay. Oh, wow. That's a crazy good end one. What is a lesson you will take away from our conversation? I've struggled a lot with building close relationships over my life because with my parents, for a long time, I felt so much obligation that turned into guilt. And I think that guilt stopped me from feeling I could be truly close to them because I just feel guilty. And I think... I also struggled a lot making friends because I just felt so anxious of, are people going to like me? I'm going to disappoint them. Like, what's going to happen? And now I'm in a place in my life where I have a lot more people I care about, a lot more friends. My co-founder um, has been there from forever, honestly. And I think that I almost felt we're trying to figure out the place of people that I'm close with that I also work with. Like, I'm like, he's my friend, but I'm also in business with him. Like, yeah. is he just a friend? And I actually talked, we were very open. We talked about it. You know, the way he described it was really beautiful in a way. He said, you know, he's like, I don't know if you're my friend because we don't just talk about friendship things anymore. We can't just go hang, right? Yeah. That was work. He said, I don't know if you're my friend. And I was like, well, I felt a little hurt by that. And then he said, well, he's like, you know, he has a sister. He's like, I have his, he's like, I have my sister. He's like, I don't know if she's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But she's my sister. And like, he's like, I guess I could see her my brother, but I really think like, you're just my co-founder. You're my partner. Like, that's just a bucket in its own right. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. And I've been processing that. And I, I think listening to you describe, like you've done business with all your close friends. Yeah really beautiful and it makes me i feel a little bit better at like yeah it's not like friendship is like no you like oh well you can't be friends with people you do business with it's like no like it is it's still it's still a meaningful friendship yeah. and you can still care about them that way and the other big thing is oh i gotta like i said i haven't seen my family for a while because of just the guilt i feel and i think just the fear of like in a weird way i think we felt similar things and responded in different ways for you you're like oh my god i need to see them a lot and like work for them and make sure like they're good. And I think for me that manifested like, I'm just scared of seeing them, man, yeah. because I just, the enormity of how much I owe 
is so present when I see them that it feels like I will never make that up. Yeah. So I think that's why I don't see them because it feels like almost too much. Yeah. But, you know, maybe I should think about that a bit more. Yeah. You should call your mom after. <laughs> should, man. I really should. <laughs> what, uh, what, what about for you? What's the lesson you're going to take away? Go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great fucking lesson, my guy. And try at least like three, four, five. Same way you work out. You go to the gym. Yeah. You got to get your reps in. Yeah. Yeah. No, but really, though, I, I will... Um, whether it's through, uh, you know, a real therapist yeah. or just sitting down with whoever and just being like, no, no, go, go see a fucking yeah. real therapist. <laughs> I love you. Like, let me build us some wiggle room. Like, maybe it's just me talking to chat GPT, you know, just like Snapchat, that. Snapchat AI, <laughs> yeah, Snapchat AI. Like, yo, I'm feeling sad today. No, see a fucking real therapist. Make, make that a goal. I, I will be checking in on you. Yeah. On yeah. This. No, for sure. For sure. Woo, we did it. We did, man. Yeah. Come up here. Give me, give me a hug. Oh.